Today we're discussing The Legends of Luke Skywalker by Ken Liu. And stay tuned until the end when the author will join us to answer some of your questions about the collected stories. The Star Wars Show Book Club is a series where we gather friends and fans to read Star Wars books, examining how they relate to all of the Star Wars films, live action shows, animated series, comics, and games. Through these stories, we enrich our understanding of the galaxy far, far away. Kristen Baber here, and this week we're discussing one of my all-time favorite Star Wars books, The Legends of Luke Skywalker, with a couple of new friends. Our story begins aboard a cargo ship headed to Canto Bight, the same dazzling coastal city we glimpsed in Star Wars The Last Jedi. Along the way, the deckhands pass the time swapping six stories about Jedi Knight Luke Skywalker as he faces Jabba the Hutt, explores a space slug, and rescues R2-D2 from certain doom, all while collecting information on the Jedi Order. Larger than life and more myth than man, the far-flung tales share a theme with the film. The legends of Luke, the Force, and the Resistance are more than just mere tall tales. They exist to give a whole new generation hope and belief in themselves. Now let's meet our book club crew. First off, we have Jenny, Associate Project Manager for ILMX Lab. Fun fact, R2-D2 was her ring bearer. We also have Kevin, who has written several Star Wars stories, including a new ongoing Marvel comic that's part of Star Wars The High Republic publishing project. And Christopher, a big Luke Skywalker fan and the voice of pilot turn spy Kazuta Ziono on Star Wars Resistance. We also have a special guest, Endor, the dog, is joining us uh, with this conversation, so I'm sure he'll have lots of opinions too. Big Luke fan over there. If everyone can just go around and talk about their favorite story from the book to get us started. I thought the first one where they're in the cantina and the woman's talking about what she saw as Luke Skywalker and the the O Kenobi gang, which I laughed out loud so many times during that story. This whole like propaganda story that had been concocted from the Empire or just like had been spread out through Empire supporters or whatever. It was just so cool to hear the story from the perspective of people who don't know these characters as heroes the way that we do. I really enjoyed stories four and five, getting stuck in the space slug and, and Exogorth, awesome. But story four was really beautiful because it did remind me of when Luke was being trained with Yoda and their path of Luke being so challenging and asking why, why this and why that, and asking everything like, like an infant. And at the very end, he understands the why. I love the way you go from the out and out Star Wars is weird and is always quite a lot better when it's weird with the story of the flea. Because let's face it, who doesn't love a story about a sentient flea in Jabba's palace? And the other story for me was iDroid, um, just because again, it, seeing the universe from the droid's point of view is always interesting because we don't usually see it. So we, we, the droids are our windows to the Star Wars universe, universe so much, but we never really hear what they're thinking. One of the things I love uh, with Star Wars is when it doesn't take itself too seriously. So uh, you know, first off, if we can talk a little bit about, a little bit more about the Mythbuster. You know, we get this unofficial story of Luke Clodhopper, and he's lazy, and he's shiftless, and he's flying around on the century turkey, and it just felt like the perfect introductory story to me because it poked so much fun at itself. What did you guys think about this opener? I agree. I think it was the perfect opener. As Star Wars fans, we are always looking for that connective tissue. We, we live for Easter eggs. You know, like every time we watch a trailer or read a book, we're diving into, what does that mean? Have I seen that character before? And this one, it was so easy to just sit back and, and just let it wash over you. Like you didn't have to dig for any of that. It was all just there, ready for you to, to take on and absorb. Yeah, I think I actually guffawed when I got to the part two where they said, did you know Jar Jar and Lord Vader were the same person? <laughs> More did you speak? Did we lose Cap? Yeah. We lost Cap. Yeah. Okay. Christopher, if you just want to keep talking maybe and then we'll see if Cap yeah. returns. We're just gonna replace his screen with Endor. That's it. Like Endor now gets his own <laughs> camera. Cav's out. Endor's in. I think we have an Akbar situation here. Is he real? I know. Oh no. Kevin Scott, not a real author. He's just been a puppet this whole time. It's a trap! Throughout the intro, I, I remember reading <clears throat> and being like who is this cloaked figure? Who is this guy that's like kind of asking questions and chuckling? And I was like, no, it's gotta be Luke. It's gotta be Luke. And as I continued reading, I was like, no, it is Luke. And um, <laughs> I loved I loved how they introduced Luke into little bits of every story. But in this one, especially, Reddy was just poking holes and making fun of every character. It kind of makes you think about 
any story you've ever heard in your life, like any any historical story, anything that like your grandma told you, it kind of makes you think about those stories in a different way because you're like, how skewed is this? They don't make it ambiguous what the moral of the story is. They say it, you know? it. It's important to listen to other people's stories, even if you don't agree with them, so you know what's out there. Kev, I'm sorry we lost you. Everything is working so well. Don't tempt <laughs> fate. I know. As soon as I started to say it, I thought, why? Why would you do that? Luke Clodhopper certainly is a, a little bit uh, on the lighter side, but you know, the Starship Graveyard, the second story, I thought gave us a really interesting view of Luke Skywalker and Jakku through Imperial eyes. Uh, but also I think this is the story where we first hear the phrase, we are all Luke Skywalker in the book. What does that mean to you? And what do you think it means to the characters who are sharing the story? Well, I think that this was the only story for me in the book where I thought that there was some question about whether or not it actually was Luke Skywalker. I don't know that this was Luke. I think it's maybe someone who has been inspired by Luke Skywalker and also tries to do the right thing and then uses, invokes the name of Luke Skywalker to get people to follow him by saying, yes, this is who I am. This is who we all are. We can all be like this. Because it's been seen through an Imperial's eyes. The only frame of refer reference uh, an Imperial has is Darth Vader. And so when you see Luke in space pulling spaceships down from, from the sky of the Force, for me that's the Imperial mind of what the Force actually is, because that's all they've ever known. And um, the only sorcerer they know is clad in black. Um, and, and, then, and then you get the, the real Luke, who's the one who sees someone in pain and wants to save them and wants to keep them out of danger. Luke in space in ships. Can, can anybody translate binary? <laughs> R2, R2, please. I'm so sorry you're having such technical issues, Kev. By the way, Kev, I absolutely love your storytelling. I can listen to you talk all day. Just a beautiful resonance and a European accent. I'm like, ah, oh, go on. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, read us the, read us the yeah. cereal box, Kev. Just yeah. I can do that. Hang on. I'm going to move us right along to Fishing in the Deluge. The whole book does this really well, but this story in particular, I thought just did an exquisite job of showcasing how different people might interpret something like the Force. So I thought that was a really cool way to take that idea and put it into Star Wars. It's interesting, like you said, exactly what you said, to see people who see the Force differently. I mean, you know, it's like we, people all over this, the, the Star Wars universe or whatever universe wouldn't know the same terminology for everything that they see, especially if they're isolated. So. Clearly a civilization or a people that are very water-based and their their whole life has to do with the sea, the tide is gonna be what they would refer to as an all-powerful thing that unites everyone. I did like how her and her brother, they had a competition. And because she allowed her ego to get the best of her, they saw the storm coming, but she was like, I'm, no, this is the biggest catch and I'm gonna hold on to it rather than just separating herself from her ego and knowing that she had won, she stayed with it and that's where the punishment kind of happened, mm. going against the tide. So it was foreshadowing uh, when Luke himself goes through the trials and he catches the largest golden fish there is, but he's like, I don't need it. It's also a balance to um, Obi-Wan as well. And, and you know, what we hear repeatedly through the book about his mastery, his teacher and Obi-Wan losing so everyone could win. And then later on, we find out that Luke does exactly the same. So. Um, I thought that was, a, that was a really good balance there. Um, the one thing I loved in this story was the fact he was called the Seeker, because I can't think of a better um, name for Luke Skywalker, because he spends the entire film series seeking for things. So I loved iDroid. I thought it was really powerful because there's so many layers to it. What do you think you would do in Luke's position? I mean, it's really easy to say what you would do in a situation, but um, I think that I would have done the same thing, and I'll tell you why because droids have always been my favorite characters in Star Wars. I mean, clearly, you know, I have a deep love for R2-D2 since I was a kid. I wouldn't have been able to leave anything behind that reminded me of him. Just like if I went in to rescue Indoor, my dog from somewhere, and there were other <laughs> dogs that need to be taken out. <laughs> you would just be like, get all, all in the bag, come on. But using the metaphor, Jenny, that you said, like R2 being kind of like a pet, thinking about that, if I were to come in and see R2 there, I'd be like, oh my, my baby like but then the female droid who's got that chip implanted to to be the enforcer kind of like a, a rabid dog coming at me i don't know if i would have the patience i'd be like whoa what the and protect myself but luke yeah. was so calm and understood no there's there's kindness 
That's what sums up these characters so well and why they're heroes, because they do what we hope we would do and we perhaps know that we wouldn't all the time. And, you know, and yeah, Luke, Leia, they see the good in people and that's what we want to be. Also, sliced mm -hmm. off her limbs. Just wanted to throw that out there. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. There were, there's, I mean, it's Star Wars. There's always, somebody's losing a limb. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone needs a hobby at the end of the day. Thank you guys so much for joining me. This was super fun. Uh, and I'm so glad that we could all get together and chat about the Legends of Luke Skywalker. Like, subscribe to this channel below. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Do it for Kristen. Say thank you. <laughs> all right, today we're joined by Ken Liu. Hey, Ken. Hi, Kristen, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing well. All right, excellent and grammatically correct, which we appreciate here. <laughs> this one's just hands down my favorite uh, handle, I think. Franklin in space. <laughs> what message do you hope that readers will take with them to apply in their own life after reading the book? You know, it's, uh, it's actually explicitly spelled out in the book. Uh, we're all Luke Skywalker. I wrote the book because, you know, I love Luke. I think a lot about what Luke means to the folks in the Star Wars universe and to fandom in general and to um, old fans as well, new fans. Uh, one of the things about Luke that I think is particularly interesting is you really do see his journey uh, throughout the saga from when he was just a little boy all the way up through uh, ultimately to this amazing figure that we all really admire. And that journey uh, reflects all of us in different stages of our lives. You mentioned you've always been a Luke fan. Can you talk about what made you a Luke fan long before you ever wrote a story about Luke? My particular experience was uh, one time uh, there was an exam uh, the next day, a final exam for a class, uh, and I had not study much for that class. So my usual practice is to cram the night before. And then I thought, you know, I, I need to motivate myself somehow. I went to the bookstore right around the corner and uh, bought the latest Star Wars Expanded Universe trilogy. And I was like, this will be my reward. I'm gonna study one chapter and read a chapter. I, I read one chapter and then I was like, oh, this is too good. I have to read another one. Well, this is the sort of thing Luke would have done. So, you know, I, I have no regrets. <laughs> I will use the force. You know, that brings me to another question I actually had for you, which is the tale of Lugubrious Moat in particular was a little unexpected. <laughs> Did you have a lot of stories or elements in this book that you were writing them in and thinking, I don't know if they're gonna let me get away with this, but I'm gonna try? And was that uh, one of them? That, that was not one of them. There were others. I mean, I, um, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I mean, I put the Konami code in there, um, especially in the Lugubrious Mode story that I was not sure I was going to get away with it, but I did and people have noticed it, so that's pretty funny. Star Wars Book Club superfan Kanja Chris, who I hope never changes her name, wants to know which story about Luke was your favorite to write and why? The Tale of Lugubrious Mode actually has a special place in my heart because it's the very first story I wrote when I was writing this collection. And there are times where I think about the Starship Graveyard we're not even sure Luke actually appears in that story at all. There's a certain way to read the story that says that actually is Luke. But another reading would say, no, that's not Luke at all. It's just somebody who really took to heart the message that we're all Luke Skywalker and is using Luke Skywalker as a symbol. And I love that instability. I, I, I love the way that story allows you to really um, tell the story that that plays right on the edge of whether this is canon or not. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And this was illuminating. I could listen to you talk all day long about writing and storytelling and these characters in particular. This was really fun. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Ken. And thanks to all of you who joined us from home, sent in your questions and watched along. Come back in two weeks when the Star Wars Show Book Club returns to dig into The Mighty Chewbacca in the Forest of Fear by Tom Engelberger. And don't forget to tweet your questions using the hashtag SWSBCChewy. And we'll ask some on the show. Until then, may the Force be with you.